Okay. Hey there, uh, welcome to today's art history talk here at uh, Reinventing the Tattoo. We are uh, gonna be talking today with Gunnar. And uh, Gunnar is somebody that I've known through the tattoo scene for decades. And he's always been known for his kind of stylized illustrative tattooing. But there's always been this very interesting twist to it, the, this kind of classical twist. And every now and then he uh, posts pictures of things that he's photographed in art museums and that kind of thing. And clearly has put a lot of thought into you know observing and taking in this art and has shared his observations. Always very interesting. So uh, for our second uh, art history talk, this is our second, we uh, talked with Travis Louie a couple of weeks back. Uh, we've got Gunnar on and uh, we're gonna take a little bit of a dive into his favorite artists and uh, influences and maybe talk a little bit about how that is uh, propagated out into his tattooing. Uh, first, I wanted to mention uh, before we get rolling into this, uh, this is a Reinventing the Tattoo uh, production and we have a lot of free uh, content available that is the easiest to access if you install the Reinventing the Tattoo app, which is free at the App Store. And we do not collect oh. or sell your data. No. Um, yeah. For connecting us. So, uh, yeah. Um, and one of the things is if you decide to uh, actually join the Reinventing the Tattoo curriculum, uh, which is my paid uh, educational content. Every Monday night, we've got these exercises. We've been doing it as a group and it's been a blast. So I just wanted to mention that before we started rolling into this. All right, Gunnar, thank you for joining us. Uh, you're in Atlanta right now. Where are you kind of permanently based? No, I need my phone. Huh? Oh, sorry. Uh, right now, I'm actually, I'm down in, um, in Atlanta area, visiting Russ Abbott at Ink and Dagger. So I've been hanging out here for a little bit and uh, doing some tattooing down here. So you have a permanent base right now, or are you still kind of bouncing around? I current no, I currently don't. When uh, when all the COVID <laughs> stuff happened, life life got thrown into disarray for a bit, and it happened to be at a time when my lease was coming up, and they we were put out of work uh, without really knowing how long that was going to last for, and so. Uh, rather than renew renew a lease that was um, gonna go up in rate and not knowing if I'd be built going back to work, I decided to go on the road for a bit and just, I went and spent some time with my family and took care of my grandmother for a while in the early parts uh, and then decided I needed to get back to work. So I was out of tattooing for about seven months um, before deciding to kind of get back out and go back to work, so. Yeah, and then suddenly you're posting some large work again, which is cool to see. Yeah, it's good to like it's it's good to be tattooing um, again. I just need my phone. Sorry, give me one second. Russ, gotta get my phone when you get a chance. So, um, I just have my notes for. Um, uh, yes, yes. So it's it's um yeah it's good to be back working. I actually had planned on retiring this year, oddly enough, from from tattooing for a bit because I was hoping to be moving to India this year and spending some time over there. Um, and I just didn't, I kind of had to announce retirement because I didn't know what that would look like, how profound a change that would make to my life. And so I wanted like clients to head on going projects to kind of have some forewarning. And then, uh, and then when COVID hit, all the travel stuff went on, you know, went on, uh, became non-existent. And so um, it was really interesting because I got thrown into like seven months early retirement because of the COVID and then decided to, uh, you know, I started delving back into art and I started like, I didn't really have an, a living, uh, like a way to make a living outside of just selling drawings. And so I started drawing a lot again, probably probably more than I've drawn in, in quite a few years for myself where it wasn't just drawing for like tattoo projects and whatnot. And, um, and then it like reinvigorated me again. And so then I was excited. I was like, man, I got to get back out and start producing again. So um, outside of just sketches and stuff. So it's felt good. It's really nice to be back to back to work a little. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that we all had our routines changed in a way that, you know, caused us to at the very least appreciate the things that we couldn't do anymore. But, uh, you know, I think many of us ended up kind of diving into some kind of a side thing, you know, because we couldn't tattoo for a stretch or yeah. greatly reduce tattooing. And so 
you know, it's been interesting to see the different varieties of, of things that artists have gotten into. Uh, yeah, yeah. Watching, watching, like it's interesting because there was it almost was two routes. There were people that kind of stopped producing altogether. They were it seemed like they were really stressed out uh, emotionally and couldn't couldn't produce. And then I think other people that delve back into the production because it was the escape. I, I mean, at least I think that's like for someone like myself, like art has always been the like go to go to escape. So. Uh, I thought that was an interesting thing to be able to watch happen with people, you know. So if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your, uh, you know, you're talking about arts and escape. Is this something that goes all the way back to childhood? And, and what were the things that hooked you on art? And how did that end up steering you into tattooing? The, you know, I think as a kid, I was, I think I, did, you know, kind of got to start it like a lot of kids do where I, you know, I drew, I doodled or I would draw like comic book images I saw. But when I was a kid, I never fundamentally like was going after art really too much. Like a lot of kid, young, a lot of like I'll meet tattoo artists and they were like, man, I knew when I was like three, I was going to be an artist. And I just didn't have that confidence. Um, and so I had done some stuff like for hardcore, you know, I was in hardcore band when I was in high school and kind of like part of that punk rock skate culture. And so I had done some you know, just like little flyers for hardcore venue shows. Um, and so I did stuff like that and, and didn't really take it too seriously. And then when I was in college, uh, I got an opportunity. I had started drawing tattoo designs for myself and, and some of my friends. And, um, and I got asked to ask if I was interested in taking on an apprenticeship. And so I wasn't really as, much into art when I got into tattooing. Um, I always kind of say like I was a tattooist that became an artist rather than an artist that became a tattooer. Um, so my art, kind of my art um, exploration didn't really begin till I started tattooing. Like what brought me into tattooing initially was the like, I was really, really fascinated by the traditional designs. I kind of like being part of that, like, you know, more punk rock, like rockabilly culture and it, at that time in my life, um, it was like more of the traditional tattoos that I was drawn to. And so I started doing, I started drawing a lot of stuff like that, like a lot of traditional flash tattoos. And, and that's kind of what segued me into tattooing. And then when I got into tattooing, um, I started becoming exposed to to different types of tattoo arts that, you know, like some of the stuff that was happening in the West Coast, some of the stuff you guys were doing out at, at Guilty and Innocent at the time out in Chicago. Um, and then guys like little Vinnie Myers and Dave Waugh, you know, they had like these flash sets. And, um, and so I started being introduced to like a new variety of art stuff outside of that traditional format that I didn't know existed in tattooing when I was younger. And then when I saw what was being done in flat, like in flash designs at that point and some of the custom tattooing, that's when I really decided to like delve into like, man, I really got to learn how to be an artist. Like that was, it was more like I was tattooing, like I could do a tattoo, but then I was like, I got to learn to do art. Like I want to be one of these guys. I want to do what these guys are doing. And so that's when my, like my, uh, I became really ambitious about become learning to be an artist. So, so at some point you began connecting with classic art that appealed to you and, uh, and you shared some of it with us, uh, since this wasn't something like you were raised in a family that took you to art museums every weekend, but you discovered art through tattooing. How did that lead you then down the path towards learning a little bit more about classical art history? Well, I, you know, I was kind of lucky. My dad took, did take me to the Dolly Museum when I was a kid in high school. And he took me to the Smithsonian Museum. Um, I think he tried, you know, was trying to give us a little culture, I guess. And so I had seen stuff. But then when I got into tattooing, you know what it was is um, I would see the book, the, sh the books on the shelves of the artists who, who I was apprenticing under, you know, or, or apprenticing around. And the first thing I had apprenticed originally under a guy named uh, Z out in New Haven. And he was, you know, an older guy. He came from like the spider web part of tattooing, you know, the East Coast, 
uh, era of tattooing. And so he did a lot of fine line black and gray. So the early exposures I had, you know, he was doing the like large Giger, you know, pieces. And then a lot of the stuff, you know, you'd see like Michelangelo or Bernini, you know, books were always, there were like certain books you'd always see on like certain tattooers shelves. It was always the like the Michelangelo, the Leonardo da Vinci's, uh, the Gil Elvgren books and the, and the George Petty's, which are like pinup artist guys. Um, so I'll kind of like, I, I brought some pictures so I can interject with pictures if that's helpful. Um, yeah, anytime you want to pop something on the screen, we'd love to see it. Okay, so yeah, so those were the earliest influences. And so my first, actually my first like forearm tattoos, I don't know if they show up, but was Moses um, from Michelangelo. And I'll just put this on the screen. This was the, one of the first like visible tattoos I got was this character. Uh, which is Michelangelo's sculpture of Moses. And uh, one of the things I liked, why I got it, the little bit of art history, is that um, if you see on the top of his head, he's got these two horns that um, come up off of his hair. Oh, yeah. You can kind of see it right there. Uh, what had happened is he had misinterpreted, I guess it's the word Karen, I believe is the correct word, the Hebrew word. And it's supposed to mean rays of light, but it also can be interpreted as horns. And so um, I believe Moses was supposed to have beams of light behind him. And he ended up, um, he ended up uh, misinterpreting and putting horns on his head. So I ended up getting it tattooed on me because I was like, man, if Michelangelo can make a mistake, then we're all, you know, <laughs> capable of at least having one mistake in our, in our, our careers. Uh, and I kind of thought that was like a neat, like, you know, it, it made it like, oh man, we're all, you know, this is something that all of us can do, you know, that because we're all fallible, you know? So um, that was the first one. And then I had followed it with, uh, and I think like the collection of tattoos was, you know, kind of helped and inspired my early inspirations. But then the second one I had gotten was um, the Pieta by, by um, Michelangelo. And then I had gotten this Bernini statue right here. So we'll see if I can't show you that. So I had right. gotten that as another one of my forearm tattoos. And, and the sculptures had worked so good as, as tattoos, you know, like they had, the, you know, good values and um, they just made for really good uh, kind of fine line style tattoos at the time. So those were some of my early like influences in art uh, and, and what could be done I had gotten tattooed. These were actually done by, oops, Eric Merrill did these uh, back at Dark Side Tattoo. So anybody from that like 90s era is sure to know who he was. You know, he was a big name back then. And so he had done, he had done that. And then um, I had Corey Kruger had done this other, uh, you know, these cherubs and stuff. So I was really into that like Italian Renaissance are very early in my tattooing and being able to see like how they could do it in this illustrative mode. Like there's still line work in these, you know, there's color and stuff. And so they were kind of pushing the bounds of, of what could be done, taking traditional uh, classical art and then bringing it into a tattooable, kind of that traditional tattoo format where it was line work, shading, color, you know, the way I was brought up to tattoo, line work, shade, color. And so it was kind of like seeing how they were able to carry this, this fine art into the tattoo art world, uh, which I thought was really neat. And so that, that had like a huge impact on me, like because those guys were really capable tattooers. And so they were really able to, um, to open up my mind to what could be done, so. Nice. Yeah, it's uh, interesting when you start discovering that there's a larger world of art and, uh, you know, I've, I've talked to a lot of tattooers who, I mean, kind of went down this, this same path of really discovering art, you know, a, a bit into their careers. I mean, they, they kind of get settled into, uh, you know, finally having some skills of their own and uh, they get more curious. Um, yeah. So at some point you began making, deliberately making trips to art museums. You were saying to yourself, I want to know more. I want to take in more, absorb more. Uh, what initially led you there? Was this something you did on your own or with friends? Yeah, so I guess the first, 
the, the guy, that guy Z, the first thing he said was build a reference library was one of the earliest like tips he taught me. Build a reference library, like start collecting stuff that inspires you. And so that's what I did. I set out and I started, started building this large book collection of um, things that I just, artists that I admired and, and, and their work like found a way of segueing in, whether it was a style that like I was aiming for or not, it, you know, I would kind of like see what I could do to bring it into my work. Um, so and you were so, thinking about it, all of it in the context of, of your tattooing. Um, what were some of these first books that you collected? So, so when my career really like the earliest books I got, it was the Gil Elvgren stuff, the pinup stuff. So it was, yeah. you know, and, and George Petty. So, you know, George Petty was, oops. So George Petty kind of looked, you know, it was like stuff like this. And I thought it, you'll see this as like a tradition in the traditional tattoo. You'll see the like Sailor Jerry version of the pinup girl, you know, it was a classical motif, but he was able to do it in a way that just kind of had like a new style, you know, it was a different style. And what I liked, what, what I still see happening to tattooing today, and you would see it back then is like when everybody's kind of eating or drinking from the same water, you know, the puddle starts to get, you know, very shallow. And so everybody's style starts to look really similar. And so when I had kind of discovered this idea of like, if we start pulling influence from outside of the tattoo world, <clears throat> then, then it expands what we can bring into the world of tattooing, you know, and it can also like help, help us stand out a little. So Petty was kind of like these early influence, Gil Elvgren, I liked his, his was a little bit more pain, painterly, but these were some of the like things you would see um, early on in my portfolio, because I liked pinup art, that was kind of the next transition, I went from traditional tattoo into liking these pinup girls, which was still a part of the traditional tattoo realm, but now it was starting to push me into these like more painterly imagery, and then I moved to a shop. I went and um, opened up my first shop, Gods and Monsters, uh, in Columbus, Ohio. And I got to work with, with uh, this guy, Ho, and another guy named Tom Cinnamon. And um, both of them are exceptional tattooers. And, and they both were painting at the time. And they were the guys who kind of introduced me. I was, you know, I was a tattooer. So I drew flash. I had lots of flash seats and they were all done with color pencil. Um, and that was all I knew. And these guys were painters, they had some art background and were like, you should try painting. And so they introduced me to painting. And that was when, once I learned to paint or like started going into painting, that's when everything changed for me because that's when I like started really being passionate about studying painting, paintings, you know, not just tattooing. And so that's when I, that's when I started going to like more gallery shows. And at the time, like it was in the, this would have been like the late nineties, early two thousands, early two thousands. So a lot of the same influences that Travis was talking about were guys that influenced me. And so you had guys like Robert Williams at the time um, and Todd Shore who were very similar um, artists. So this is some Todd Shore stuff. And, and if you know my work at all, you can almost see the direct correlation to, to my work through this. So this is- Yeah, touch, absolutely. Touch. All that exaggerated lighting, the, uh, you know, very quirky characters, the, the painterly backgrounds, the kind of evocative lighting uh, in, while still having sort of cartoony or whimsical elements. Uh, and then of course, Williams, he, uh, you know, he was kind of there first with that stuff and he, uh, always would have like a chrome element, a cartoon element, yeah. a realistic element, you know, this sort of uh, interesting uh, combination of stuff. Yeah, so, and, and I think what, at the time, let's see if I can pull myself back. At the time, I had, I had also had kids by this time. So I was around cartoons all the time, you know, like I'm raising my daughters and I'm watching cartoons and I, so those were segueing their way into my life. And then to see these artists that were taking iconography that I was used to, you know, some of the kitsch stuff from my youth and then mixing it with fine art, that like really like, you know, hit something with me where it was like playful and fun, but then like also making it more of a fine art rather than just, a, you know, a straight cartoon image. So, 
So that's kind of like what I wanted to learn. How do you like, how do you bring those two together, this world of fine art and cartooning and being a tattooer? Like, how do I bring all these elements together and make it something where it's still a strong tattoo that'll last, you know, as well as something that's playful and fun and has these, you know, historic art elements. So that's how all those elements, I think that's like what I would do is, and, and I would like kind of like pull them all together like a hodgepodge and then see which ones worked like, you know, like kind of like a chef, like trying all the different flavors and seeing which ones actually worked together and what didn't. So that, that's how that stuff kind of fell into my lap, I guess, or, or also helped me develop my style. So. Yeah, well, that was also sort of a moment in art. You know, we had the uh, the ascendancy of so-called lowbrow art, which we talked about with Travis and Louis about this last week, and that sort of morphed into what later was was uh, known as pop surrealism. Yeah. Um, although, you know, he's reluctant to identify solely with any one group, as I think any artist should be. You know, uh, he he kind of said that to each one of those things kind of marks a moment in time. You know. Uh, and so, yes, there was this, this lowbrow art moment in time. And definitely there was a little bit of an intersect with tattoo culture. We had <clears throat> Juxtapose magazine and we had the tattoo magazines kind of like next to each other on, on the magazine. Oh, yeah, because yeah. Yeah, it's, it's that underground. It was still like lowbrow was that underground art culture. So which is why I got the lowbrow, because it wasn't, right. uh, you know, was it museum quality yet? You know, I mean, now you're seeing guys like Mark Ryden in the museums, but back then you weren't. But it's like any, you know, the hardest thing is that all those, every moment artistically where there's like a massive change from what the, what the wealthy norm is, has some reluctance in it. You know, you, you see that in the impressionist movement, like there was a lot of hesitance at that time period to even allow those people into the gallery to be seen. And yet look at, you know, with hindsight, we can see just how important that, that movement was. They had know. to basically rent their own space. Yeah, you yeah, they had, to create, they had to create their own gallery, yeah. And I think that's what kind of that lowbrow movement is. And I think, and I think tattoo, you know, it's all those things coincide. It's that punk rock culture, the hot rod culture, the tattoo culture at that time, you know, all those like underground things that kind of like seem to seem to weave, weave with, within each other because the artists moved, you know, fluidly from each, you know, they were hanging out at the punk rock shows or they were hanging out at the, you know, they were doing graffiti or they were doing, you know, lowbrow art and they would all show up at the same venues. And so I think they're all somehow interconnected, you know. There's like, a, right. I mean, there's a reason they'd be sold side by side in the magazine stores. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 these are the same people who are interested in these things. Uh, and in, in general, these are going to be a little bit more adventurous personality types, a little bit less conventional, a bit more ready to reject, you know, like yeah. what is expected of you if you're going to be a mainstream artist, you know. Uh, and, Whereas now, so, and and now you look at tattoo and now we are more in the culture section. So now you're going to see us next to fashion and, fashion right. you know, like the, the narrative has changed for, you know, how tattooing is seen compared to how both all that was seen. You're also going to see that with the juxta, you know, with those magazines, now they're becoming more, they're, you know, they're the, right. the Miami basil or whatever, basil down in Miami, right, exactly. you're see, you know, you, they are the mainstream art. They're the mainstream now. Yeah, they so they went from being that we're on the bottom shelf to starting to make the way to the eye line sh shelf, you know, yeah. like. Well, I, I think part of that is for the same reason that tattooing is, is because it's been improved, you know. I mean, these same artists have stuck with it and cross-pollinated beautifully and created, uh, you know, a higher and higher levels uh, within those genres, uh, whatever you want to call them. And... Uh, there comes a point where, I mean, I'd like to believe that, you know, a certain level of quality just becomes hard to deny. But, you know, then Travis, Louie and I were talking about uh, people like uh, uh, Maxfield Parrish, you know, I mean, an yeah. incredible uh, artist who uh, is really just known as an illustrator, right? Uh, yeah. You won't necessarily see him hanging in the Art Institute of Chicago, even though his paintings are just as beautiful as anything there. Uh, because yeah, here I pull one. you know he didn't play that same art game you know he was a, uh he his art was in millions of american homes in the form of calendars for general electric and that kind of thing yeah. 
Uh, so he was broadly known, uh, you know, like Norman Rockwell, right? But, uh, you know, you're not going to see that in the Art Institute of Chicago. There's like a certain segment of art that's allowed to be in those vaunted halls. Yeah. Well, that's, a, you know, it's funny. One of my one of my big art influences, this guy, Thomas Hart Benton, and you'll understand, I think, when you, this, oops, he's part of what was called the regionalism movement. So they were, was kind of cartoon, cartoon, what would be considered lowbrow at the time. And yeah, you know, there's a big piece of his at the Art Institute, and it stands out so much, you know, I mean, it just... Yeah, the, the the problem with art like that is everything else in the room doesn't even get noticed. Yeah, but he what one of the things that I liked about him is he um, he rejected highbrow art, and so he wanted to create art for the every person, and so it was super intentional that he took himself from what could have been museum caliber at the time and is museum caliber now to the everyday people. Like, how do I bring this down so that everybody anywhere can enjoy it? Because they felt that like a lot of people were being kind of left out of, out of the art world. And oddly enough, he's the teacher who taught, or was the guy who uh, got Jackson Pollock's career, uh, was Jackson Pollock's teacher. And you see how far Jackson Pollock like diverged from right. that, that influence, you know? But I think that's a really interesting part of art, you know, American art history, because that's just, our American art history is, cult is so tiny. We're like really tiny in the scheme of art. Um, so it's interesting to look back and see the players we have that were kind of, you know, transformational for, for art here. Well, one thing about, uh, you know, Benton's work, it, it's, you know, it's highly stylized. Uh, now th this is, you know, we had this lead up to a, a, the point when the camera was invented where, artists were trying to depict things more and more realistically, you know, yep. people and scenes. They were just, they were trying to be a camera. And of course they were trying to make beautiful art also, but uh, you know, once, once we had the camera to record those details, uh, abstraction started happening a lot more. I mean, it seemed like then it was almost necessary uh, in order for these painters to remain relevant when you had a thing that you could just record the scene with by pushing. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I'm sure that that camera was a huge game changer for the art world. But I think art world, the art world was also in a weirdly explosive, like trying to get away from the old ways. I mean, even with the Impressionist movement, they were trying to break away from the, you know, the telling biblical stories and mythologies and moving into, um, you know, more, more of how do we take this paint outside and capture right now, like the life right now. And before it was like they were storytellers of past and then they became storytellers of the present. Um, and well, then, and, you know, like now think of artists that are like driven to only, only create what is gonna get the most likes, right? That's oh, yeah. what they were doing. It's like, okay, biblical stories, boom, everybody's gonna buy those. Yeah, 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 we gotta sell, we, gotta, <laughs> we have to sell. Uh, and yet, and back then, I think you were also waiting for the, you know, you had like what a buyer that you like worked for, like one patron. Right, your your patron so. is going to completely control your output, and uh, uh, what a relief to not be in that situation. No. Yeah, I would. I'd be curious what the art world would look like right now if we didn't have social media, just because sometimes I feel artists are letting themselves be forcefully stifled by popular demand rather than expressing themselves as true artists sometimes, you know, like I feel like there's a lot of artists that are not being their true voice and, and have now let, let pop culture, let pop, society dictate art rather than art dictate society. Like I think the nineties, you know, that era or whatever before was transforming society and culture. And now we've moved into an area where outside is influencing the artist. Uh, almost a reverse is happening. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sometimes I think it's just been a thing that's tightened down on the normal kind of like harsh laws of survival of the fittest that are just always there. You know, it's just exaggerated it to an extent where it's short circuited a lot of things. And uh, of course, we've got these algorithms that, that put an artificial twist on all yeah, of yeah. it. And, uh, yeah, uh, I know, it's a mess. I don't even know what to make of it. Uh, now, of course, I can sell art more easily now than I ever could before. 
Right. Oh, yeah, with the ease of, yeah, and we've removed galleries. So, I mean, the yep. need for them, essentially. So, yeah. But even something like, oh, I, I think I'll, I'll do a live stream of finishing this painting up and get a bunch of people watching. And then I can, you know, do an auction live also and track the auction and do all this myself and not, you know, give up a big sales commission to anybody, you know, like yeah. just a few percent to my bank company. And, you know, what I mean, so we've gained that. But what we've lost is... Uh, I don't think we spend as much time out in the woods, so to speak, you know, where, where we're just processing what we've taken in as individuals and making art from it instead yeah. our, our fingers on a pulse all the time. What, what do my public want from me right now? Uh, I need to look at the numbers. I have got the scientific data here and I, I have to appeal to the scientific data or I'm not exercising due diligence to be the most successful artist I can be. <laughs> right. And you yeah. can fall down that rabbit hole and lose yourself. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things I do find for myself, like over the years, I've discovered like more my, my center, my balance point. And for me, it is, I'll tend to like, I produce, I'll come in, I'll do a bunch of producing and then I will disappear for a minute and I'll go collecting, you know, like, so it's taking, that's why like where all the museums, like why I love museums and, and galleries more so than like just, you know, doing this with my phone is one, I get to see like how the image was meant to be seen. Like, I don't know if a two by two inch square is the optimal way to ever view art, but to get to see it in real life, you know, it's, I mean, when you go to convent tattoo conventions, there's a way big difference between getting to see a real tattoo in real life and get to see someone's, what they decide you should see version, you know, like however, you know, m messed with filtered or whatever. Well, you know what it's um, like, they, thing. You, recognize, you recognize a piece and you're just like, oh, let me see that. Here it is in yeah. real life. And it's like, okay, this is a whole different experience. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I don't know. And, and then when you see it and it's, you know, you get to like see it in movement and action, especially tattoos, you know, maybe not as much with paintings, but just to see that how it's fluid it is on the skin and, and how they work with the body. And then you're like, you leave changed. And, and those are the, you know, like I miss convention. I didn't realize I'd ever say that I was missing conventions because they were so frequent before this. But I've gotten to the point that I'm like, man, I just want to see more stuff in real life. I want to like be able to really digest it and, and see how it fits on the body or whatever. And that's what I love about museums is museums. I can go on my own pace, you know, like with a tattoo, I can only stare at someone's arm so long before they're like, I gotta go, or, you know, like <laughs> right. stop touching me. But with, you know, like you can sit there and just stare. Like, I don't like to go to the museum with people. I go by myself and I just, I can lose myself in the piece and I'll sit there and I can study it and break it apart. And how, how was this done? How are these layers created? You know, like, and I try in my head to like figure out what was their technique? Cause there's no, I can't, you know, there's no way to really study it. And any, most of the people that will tell you how these people painted, you know, 200 years ago are usually kind of make, giving you their best guess, you know, cause, cause very rarely is there like full literature on people's processes cause it was more hand down uh, verbally rather than written down. So you can go there and you can kind of break these pieces apart and, and then be inspired by them. And then you can go home and take what you learned and apply it. And um, so that's what, that's what got me, you know, deciding to go to museums. Like I've been to, uh, I've been to a fair amount of museums. I think, I think it, it ranges into, I mean, I've probably been to a, a museum in, in most major cities in the U S now, I think. So, um, and I got to say, you know, where the best hidden gem museum is, is Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Uh, they've got a bunch of Bougereaux there and uh, Jean Leon, uh, Jerome pieces. Like they've got a bunch of stuff that you wouldn't expect to be there, but they got a great collection. So What's your, uh, is there a good one in Atlanta? You know what? I haven't been out to Atlanta because of the everything going on here. So mm -hmm. uh, I haven't made it out yet. So um, I like New Connecticut has a bunch of like, good ones like the Yale Museum of Art right across the street from each other there's the British History Museum of Art and the Yale Museum of Art um, both are really neat the Yale one's really neat because it looks like a castle like when you go in it's like the rooms feel like the space where you're supposed to see art um, 
and then just stuff like you have the Norman Rockwell Museum out there, or you can go to like Olana, which was Frederick Church, who's like one of the Hudson River painters that's up in New York. You can go go to his house and actually see his home and his home studio. And then you get to like, with the Norman Rockwell one too, you can like walk into their homes and see their studios uh, mm -hmm. and and see how they, what, what, you know, like what books did Norman Rockwell have on his bookshelves? What was he looking at? What was his reference? And what was his setup? You know, how did he work? What was he looking out, out, out the window at when he was painting, you know? Like, I like that you can delve into people's studio. I like watching studio tours on, you know, when they used to put them on video, like people would put their studio tours on video. Um, but it's always neat seeing how other artists like set up their, their area and what, how their, what their process is and what's inspiring them. So. So are there any other uh, artists that you've like discovered recently that have really changed your tattooing that you'd like to share with us uh, some of your recent favorites uh you know what i'm not gonna i'm gonna get his name wrong so i had to write it down in my notes so one of my he's actually become an influence more in my paintings because i don't know how yet to transfer this into my tattooing uh is this guy carl wilhelm Diefenbach? and oh right right no quick. didn't he do that crazy epic battle scene uh no 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 that's that's all no it's, uh, no, yeah, yeah this, this is uh, this, this is a guy who does these like weird cavernous scenes yeah, and um, beautiful lighting. Yes, I've seen you post some of these before. And it was really I like the texture, so I don't know how to pull it, you know pull it off in tattooing yet. But I like the like, and it's so dark, but right. he's just got and, this know, texturing to it that you see some tattooers do these these tattoos with enormous amounts of black so that they can have these intense lighting effects. And I'd yeah. be so afraid of doing that. Um, but, you know, there's got to be some middle ground somewhere in there where you, you could exaggerate in just the right way and at least get some of that effect. But, yeah, that, that is just such a such a bold, intense lighting effect. Yeah. And I think, you know, even seeing knowing like so here's a painting I was currently working on. It's a pretty large painting, but I'm trying to capture that same cavernous cavernous effect. I mean, it's something I know you definitely do in your tattoos, but it's not. For me, I go, you know, going from the cartoon characters to trying to like explore that world, such a, such a jump that sometimes it's one, it's hard to know where even to start to take that leap, and two, to build the audience to be willing to take that leap with you. I find like every time I'm ready to explore a new style, it's like, how do I collect the canvases for this? Which is, I think, why I turned to painting so much outside of tattooing is because it allows me to explore a lot more, you know. So. Yeah, I mean, that, that's something that, uh, you know, every artist runs up against is, you know, they, they have to put food on their table. And, uh, you know, of course, you have to appeal to those numbers. But meanwhile, you've got this thing you want to try out. And, you know, I usually suggest do, do simulations of it, try, you know, doing procreate on a, on a human figure, show what it would look like, you know. And, of course, yeah. people steal your ideas, but you can't let that stop you from trying to get you know, finding that client, you know, and, yeah. and uh, there, there have been times I've posted back piece ideas and ended up getting to do that back piece. It, it does happen. Yeah, uh, that's, that's always a nice feeling, huh? Right. But, you know, I'm back, back in the olden days before social media. Um, what I used to do is I would draw this stuff. I didn't have kids yet, you know, uh, and just hang them up around my workstation. My regulars would see it. And occasionally I would get to if not move that particular piece, you know, I'd get to do that idea or a version of that idea. And it's a very gradual process. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It does not happen overnight. Yeah. That is one of the neat things I do. I like when I see like um, being on the road, it's a little tougher for me to do, but I really liked going into like artist studios that had like all their drawing render, you know, their drawings up and they've got uh, like Damien Roberts is one of the guys like from Canada that um, you always see, he's got like a, wall of drawings in his tattoo booth and you're like man if you didn't have an idea when you walked in you're going to leave with a bunch of them because it's just right. so like uh it's overwhelming the amount of you know what you can see and just take in and then you know you don't even know you are into it till you see it and then you're like oh man that one that was the one that that, that grabbed me it's a chance to let your client get to know you better because they yeah. see a bunch of stuff that you do well right? Like your, all your favorite things to draw. And they're going to sit there for a few hours absorbing that stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then especially if you're really good like that, then you <laughs> then it's even like, man, it's like getting to be in a gallery with the artist, you know? So then you can ask them about it. And, but I mean, it's a, I mean, that is the nice thing with Instagram is you get to see everybody's work all the time. Uh, you know, I'm constantly finding new artists. There's a, I, I'm not going to know her name, but she, she's a painter that, um, I'll see if I can't find her name real quick on Instagram, um, who paint kind of is like a modern version of that, uh, artist I just shared. Um, it's May, Mayina, May, underscore M A E N A. I don't know if how I would even be able to pull it up on, on here, but, um, she does these, like, what I like is that they're high, high, um, contrast so they're like real black and they're just grays but it's like black and white and heavy silhouettes what's uh, what's I, the instagram it's um underscore and then it's m-a-e-n-a -E -A underscore we'll see if I, maybe you can pull it up uh yeah. i'm not linked in that my is instagram. not her uh what's m m a -E it's got that like little like dash line and then, or maybe it's two little dash lines. Two little dash lines, and then M. Yeah, A E N A. M -A -E -N -A. And then another underscore after. Yeah, yeah. Okay, this looks a little bit more like it. One underscore after. Yeah. Visual yeah. Tales from Daisy Lands. Yeah. Okay, hold on one second. If Sorry. you don't want people to find you, you want to have you know that kind of approach to your. Instagram name. Uh, yeah. 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 So this is one of the artists who I've, I've found recently, like I said, it's outside of the tattoo world, but I just found, um, it's just this like super pretty, very low, you know, undersaturated, desaturated imagery, heavy silhouettes. Um, it's and it's moody. It's got like a mood to it. I don't know. I just, I, I'm like really, uh, I think it's really neat looking stuff. So it's digital, I believe, but. Yeah, and I mean, so much of it is anymore. And, and I try not to let that be a reason to uh, like or dislike something, right? But uh, um, yeah, that's beautiful. It, you know, it's, I don't wanna say that it's easier to make beautiful digital art than, than analog art, but to, yeah, to create this Digitally, you could do it in a couple of days. And if you wanted to do this on a panel, it would probably take you a, a couple of weeks. Yeah, and yeah. That's just the reality of it. Uh, so I try not to let myself be less impressed by digital art, but I'm still more impressed by analog art, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I, I, I struggle to, there's times where I wish I was really, um, that I could delve more into the digital realm. I mean, especially with the stuff that's happening in pro, procreate and, and the tools that are available to us now. I mean, just, you know, hanging out with Russ and he has that, does that tattoo smart stuff. And you see the tools that are available, the different brushes and stuff. And I'm like, always so like, man, I would love to do it. And I struggle, I struggle. I have a hard time jumping from that world to the other world because I grew up analog for so like the tangible, like the smell of oil and the feel of the brush on the thing. And I don't know, like, I bought the paper film for my screen, but it still doesn't feel like, yeah. it doesn't have the same feeling to me. Um, you know what so it is for me? I feel like the digital tools are great for preparing designs for a final piece that is a piece of analog art. Yes, yeah. Uh, and of course, that's just my old fashioned self because th these digital artists are gonna do way more art in their lifetimes than I will. Their art output is gonna be stunning, some of them, right? like the just the pure quality and quantity of imagery that some of these like you know the fantasy and sci-fi artists that i follow you know um, oh yeah it's just insane right and you could never do all of that as an analog artist but i think that yeah. as tattooers one of the things that makes a beautiful tattoo impressive is everyone knows it's hard even yeah. if you know nothing about tattooing you see an incredible tattoo you know that took real skill just like hearing somebody play an incredible guitar solo or something it's like almost like a superpower uh, not to say that digital art, you know, 
it's not less of, a, of an accomplishment, but I think you have to do something way more impressive in order to even stand out because there is so oh, much yeah. of it. It's so, you know, so much good stuff. Yeah, there's some, I mean, I follow quite a few like pretty amazing digital guys. Like I like Tom Bagshaw a lot. He does like, his stuff looks like oil paintings, portraitures. Um, and he's definitely prolific. Like the amount of work he does have is, is pretty impressive. Um, and and so, like I said, I feel like for me personally, cause I, I do, I paint oil and I draw and I tattoo. And then I try to utilize the iPad. For me, it's a tool like the, you know, even using these apps where I can like do my quick rough layout or I can do a quick color study and then I can take it to that world. Like you said, tra transferring it to analog. Yeah, that's a Tom Bagshaw right there. Mm. Yeah, super, just beautiful. Like, and and he and he's got a style, and you can pick it up. I don't, you know, used to have some of his paint prints in my home, and they're they're awesome. And and you can't tell, you know, like you really can't tell sometimes uh, where the digital lens and the and the oil painterly begins. But you still need to have the knowledge, you know, like you still got to be an artist to make that. He can't. There's no fake in it, you know. He can't just can't fake that yeah that one of the so here's stuff. a question for you let's yeah. fast forward a hundred years right okay. and who knows uh where we'll be with our digital tools i mean provided we don't drive our civilization over a cliff uh yeah i i would imagine a lot of the technology would disappear and it would just be in here you know oh yeah uh, yeah, yeah your subscriptions will just follow you wherever you go and they'll just be in your stream all the time uh and so if, if you wanted to be an artist, the, the art tools available would just be endless, you know? Mm -hmm. So what ends up on the, what ends up on the museum walls? Man, that, or do we even have museum walls? I've been like, really, um, I'm, I'm a guy who enjoys living in the woods. Like if I had my way, I'd have a cabin in the woods away from culture and society and make my art and then hopefully make some money to keep that lifestyle going. But then I also have a foot in like where the future's going because I feel like we have to be aware of what's happening around us. And augmented reality and virtual reality, I think are gonna be the new museums. Like I, I really like see people kind of like, I mean, with those, like with this augmented reality, you can put on glasses. I could be right in this room, walk right up to a painting that I might not be able to see in a museum that's safely tucked away in a safe somewhere. And I get to like go up and see it. And, you know, you can't touch them at the museum anyway. So, but right. I can, and then I, and I can zoom in, and pull up all the textures. Um, I think we're going to see- They a, even I, have fake glare effects. Yeah. As you move back and forth, the lamp in the room, you see the glare on the surface, you can disable that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think you're going to see, you know, like I put on my glasses and I go to the museum today or the zoo or the aquarium or whatever, you know, and I'm, walking around here. And I think you're going to see, especially COVID was an interesting thing to watch how scared, how readily like so many people were to, I don't ever want to go back outside again. If I can work from home, I'll do that forever. And I'll teach my kids from home. Like there were some people that just really embraced that life, you know? And so I think there is going to, there is a potential for the future where we don't really have a need for the physical museum as much anymore. And you can see all the art in the world behind these glasses. Like you could walk every museum in virtual reality. Right. Um, which might yeah, I be- guess, I guess the, the, the point that I'd be making is, you know, you're talking about an absolute democratization of, of cultural museum space. Yes, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, but th there's still guardians of these places because they're still actual museums right and you know hanky panky was was talking about it in a metaphor of it being almost like a cathedral when you walk into a museum it's like a secular cathedral these high vaulted spaces and this is stuff that's in this institution for a reason it is important it is relevant you can count on that knowing that you have walked into this museum and it's gone through all the the very high filtration bars in order to attain that vaunted place right yeah so you know, when, when you give it an absolute democratized, you know, kind of uh, version, then what what's important at that point? 
and is it is it a good idea to get rid of this artificial sense of importance or is it even an artificial sense of importance you know then does it just come down to what gets the most likes yeah i don't know i i also don't know if at some point are we have we reached a point like where we've hit um I think in some way, and I've heard this been said by people, and I say it myself sometimes on occasion, probably more than I should, is we've hit a point of overabundance for sensory overabundance, right? And so I, at any point, I could pick up a, a picture and, and flip through and see a million images. And it's not to say it's devalued art, but to some degree, it has in a way like where I used to like wait for the tattoo magazines, let's say, to show up, and I would see the greatest art of that month or whatever. And I would stare at that for long periods of time, the way, right. so I, revel, so the way I revel in a museum today. You couldn't just scroll to the next page. You had an X yeah. number of pages and then, yeah, once you got to the end, you had to go back to the beginning of the same magazine. Yeah. And now it's kind of like, I, you know, you often wonder how many great pieces of art have just suffered the swipe left, you know, like where, the, where they were, they should have been relevant for that period of time. <laughs> and they couldn't compete in a relevant space because they're seen on such a small screen. That's a, you know another thing you need to take into account, I guess. Like, like some of these pieces need to be seen. You know, like the thing that we were talking about, the Thomas Cole's, um, uh, the, I forget what it's called, the collapse of society or something like that. I'm gonna pull this up because this is an important one, which should be seen in real life if you, know, if you get to see it. Um, and these are massive, massive paintings and they're seen in a very specific order. They have like a very specific way they're supposed to be seen. And so I do think like, I personally hope that museums are always available. Now, will the average person, you know, take advantage of them? Like, I don't, I don't well, know. Okay, but... and back to, back to that idea of the slow drip. So there you are in a museum. You, first of all, you've gone out of your way to get there. You know, you've spent gas and time or whatever to, to get there. Uh, you're not just gonna walk away the instant you start to feel bored the way that you will with swiping, right? Yeah. And, and you, of course you can't swipe, you can walk to the next painting, but you're gonna at least take a minute at each one. And if it's a good one, you're gonna take more than a minute. You'll take it in. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's got a higher value because you're actually there and you spent your resources to get there. And it's a much more immersive experience because the thing's big and it's in front of you and, and mm -hmm. uh, there's other voices echoing around in the hall and other people looking at it and commenting. And it's, uh, it, you know, you've invested more into being there. And so you're not just going to swipe through it as quickly. And it probably engages your brain in a totally different way because of that. Oh, yeah. And, and it does. And some of those pieces you can, I mean, I know personally, I've sat before, like, like I love the Hudson River school painters, which do these massive landscapes and I've traveled the country and I've seen massive beautiful landscapes in real like real life and then I've seen these paintings and had the same awe and wonder mm. in front of this painting as I have watching a beautiful sunset over the mountains where it just is breathtaking and your mind can't wrap around how that was even created by a human hand like how was this person able to take like some some little uh, bristles on the end of a stick and mix it into some wet pigment and create this beautiful scene. And, and, and when you see it in real life and it's like this, you know, eight foot by 10 foot painting and it's just mind blowing. And there's been those moments like where I can't, I can't catch my breath. Like I'm just staring like in awe of this painting. And I, I'll never, you, I don't think you'll ever be able to do that if you don't have those, those spaces to hold that. It's sacred, it's, I mean, to some degree those things should be held to, a, you know, to some level of like. Well, just so that, that experience is even available because yeah. you're not gonna have your breath taken away the same way with, with the digital viewing experience. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe with those VR goggles, you know, if, if it's done the right way, it's possible you could have a similar experience. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, is with, with the Hudson River painters in particular, uh, you know, I think about the, the tricks that we learn as artists. Uh, you know, there, there's the visual language there, and especially, you know, those of us who specialize in abstraction, you know, you're really trying to uh, convey emotion with things like lighting and shadow and, 
and presence. And, you know, there's a lot of that in landscapes, I think. And I think landscape painters, the really good ones, they know how to reach people's emotions using these kinds of effects, certain yeah. kinds of lighting, certain temperatures, uh, you know, certain skies behind certain lighting and that kind of thing. These juxtapositions of, of color is extremely subtle, but you know, the, the really effective ones, that's not by accident. They're not just painting a pretty picture. They're using every tool they've got. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, and it is just that it is the emotion. I, I found myself super attracted to, to, to those paintings for that. Like how can to pull up a couple? A couple yeah. So I'm going to, I'm going to pull up, this is course of empire. So this is Thomas Cole painted this. And it's a series of five paintings that are basically the rise and fall of society. And so, let's see. So this is the first, very first of the series. And these are like large paintings. I mean, large scale paintings. And so this one is called The Savages. And it's essentially, I believe that's the title for this one. And, um, and so this one, is essentially the beginning of mankind. Like, you know, we're kind of, we haven't discovered like uh, our society yet and an art and whatnot. And then it moves on to this next one. And now we're starting to um, kind of, we've, we've conquered earth, right? So we've kind of, mankind has learned to subdue earth so we, that we can live within it and not be- We have an agrarian alive society. By, you know, the lions in the wilderness. Yeah. And so then it moves into, look at this, you know, opulence. And we've built this, this beautiful culture and society. And it's, and it's, I mean, it's unfortunately, it's almost what you're watching happen here. Like we <laughs> we're at this, we're kind of at this stage moving into this stage and this is the destruction. And then it like eats itself up, you know? And this is, when he was doing this, see, one of the things that I sometimes gets missed, I think in museums is, not enough people are really paying attention to not just the, we go and we look at the pictures. Like I like the pictures, but there's these, like if you take the time to, to read the stories behind the paintings or, or understand the artists and the period of time they were moving in, this was in kind of, this was in the, you know, the turn of the century where America was now becoming this like uh, moving, you know, moving into this, uh, industrial revolution period and and these fears of this collapse were amongst them and that you know these guys were watching uh, they were watching society move at the same kind of pace we're watching it happen now where like digital has been is like our fast paced you know these guys are watching the, the westward expansion and the destruction and then this rise of what's happening on the coastlines and everything's moving super fast and so they had a fear, like what happens next? Like, you know, we were, we were once just farming this land and now you're building these cities on it. And these like, these stuff is moving faster, right? It's and embodying then, these fears. And then it becomes the, you know, this, um, the desolation, what's left after, you know, the ruins of, of society's collapse. And to see these things, these were all like done as a commission painting, um, oops. So, there was this idea that this person wanted to convey this, this storyline, this rise and fall of, of society because they were afraid that that was happening. And the Hudson River painters, they at the time, this is Frederick Church, this is one of my favorites from that period. And when you see this, there's no way to see this, like do it justice here, but when you see this in real life, it's really neat. I mean, the underpainting is, is that pink magenta. So these, you know, cooler colors, I'm trying to point at stuff you can't see, but the mountains are painted almost over that purple ground. So it's coming through the rocks and stuff. It's super pretty in real life. But um, these guys were also moving, you know, this was down in South America, I believe. And so they were painting stuff that people weren't able to see in the cities. And then they would bring it back like the Technicolor version of this period of time, like this piece of, piece of uh, travel, you know, that, it was like the postcard, but here's a giant postcard of this place you're never going to get to see. And we don't have photographs yet of it. So they were able to bring back these, these um, giant images of that. And people could see this stuff. Like the westward expansion photos, like um, Albert Beardstadt would paint stuff like this. Yeah. 
And this is the Rocky, you know, this is the Rockies. And so what they were trying to do, they would paint these massive pictures and they would basically sell this to investors on the coastline that weren't going out there yet. Like, look at all the beauty that's out there. Like we need to move. They were trying to sell westward expansion at the time. And this was the sales pitch. Like, I'm going to sell you this beautiful piece of property so that you invest in it. And they didn't really have the way to capture it with the photographs the way they could capture it with these, you know, massive paintings. Oops, that's. No, that's a Russian artist. But anyways, that stuff is like, and then when you see them in real life, it's still, I, I got to imagine if you'd never seen that, like if you were stuck in New York City, you know, back during that time period and you'd never traveled West and have yet to see what a mountain range looks like, those paintings must have like, I mean, I can't imagine what that was for people. <clears throat> like how like, I don't know, like how much that altered them inside and then, how much that would make you want to head west to see that like I, wouldn't you i would want to experience that so but we we don't have that like that hindsight we don't have that part of history when we go to the museum we just are like oh look at that pretty picture and don't ever like take into account that that stuff didn't exist for those when that period was that when that was being painted during that period or even the biblical stories of someone like caravaggio who was like painting these biblical narratives so that when you went to the church and you saw this, now you had a picture to the words you were reading. Like now I could have an image to the story. It was like, you know, what TV or movies did compared to radio. So um, just that idea of like, we're kind of removed, we're so far removed from it now because we have the luxury of, of television and movies and the inundation of imagery that I don't, they didn't have back then. So you take someone's, you know, bland gray city existence and then you, give them this shot of life and man that must have been awesome like so yeah I mean, that's like that's what i like about museums just like cathedral <laughs> back in the in the peasant days you know i mean you're you're talking about an experience that's so much more vibrant and uh you know out of the ordinary you know daily life yeah it's 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 altering you know it changes you and so then that brings us back to our present day where uh there's a lot of competition for uh, getting our attention, our attention to us, and to uh, you know, it, everyone is trying to blow you away with their content all yeah. the time. Uh, uh, and so, you know, it, it could be argued that it's lost some of it to depth. You know, you look at like these Hudson River painters, and this isn't, you know, as I was saying, isn't just pretty pictures. They are using every trick. You know, you look at that stuff; these are incredibly crafted. Uh, you know, the, the use of very careful contrast to be able to express that depth and give people that, that sense of looking deep into, the, into a, a rocky space. Uh, yeah. that, uh, that oceanic feeling of that vast scale. Uh, you can't have a single value out of place anywhere or it kills the effect. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it, people really knew what they were doing. Yeah, and then... And then you're talking about like a six to nine month turnaround time, you know, like I don't have to produce a new image for tomorrow. Like, right. you know, wait, shoot, I got to beat the algorithm. I better have 25 new paintings by this week, you know, whereas <laughs> these guys were like, I'm just going to paint and then I'll show it at the Galleria or whatever. And they like focused on a painting, one big painting for the year to show off, you know, when that time came. I mean, I so, think there's something to be said for, for having pressure to produce sometimes, you know, yeah. Just so that you do get some quantity under your belt and, and you don't get caught up in doing only these gigantic things. Yeah. Uh, that's something you do once you've already mastered your, your craft, you know, uh, which is, you know, I can't ever imagine being at a place as a painter uh, myself to where I didn't feel like I still had a lot to, to just practice daily, you know. So doing those three and four hour paintings um, <clears throat> is really good. I mean, that, that keeps you fluid. And yeah. If all you do is big pieces, what happens is you're evolving while you're working on it. And yeah. you're going to solve problems as you go. And then you're going to look at your work from two weeks ago and say, oh, man, now i got to redo all of that because the lighting looks weird now that I've figured this out. And by the time that's happened to you three times in the course of one painting, you might actually get discouraged and put the thing away. Yeah, well, these guys, I mean, I think a lot of these guys were also, they did, you know, enough, they would do studies or full, like, small, you know, handable color studies to kind of like rather that you know like now we have the ability right. to do like a digital layout they would do like 
you know, small painting, like a cartoon or whatever, and then take that. Well, I mean, did, did you see all the, all the preparation that James Gurney put into his uh, uh, painting of Waterfall City for Dinotopia? I did it, but I can only imagine because that guy is the most prolific artist out there. What's that? He's got this this thick folder and it's sketches, it's uh, oil sketches, you know, little, you know, four by six things. There's, you know, some paintings that he did sitting in front of actual waterfalls just to try to get the mist right, you know, because because you're trying to pull all these things together, right? To, to pull it off, you got to get the mist effect. You got to get the light, you know, reflecting off the water just right. Every single one of these things has, has to add up. He built a small version of the city itself out of styrofoam and then a larger, more detailed version of the key building that was really going to be in the foreground. So he knew this was going to be painted from a few angles. Right? Yeah. And then was able and then was able to light it the way he needed it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so you look at this stuff that looks like it's magic. Oh, it's not magic. It's tons of hard work though. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of a lot of uh behind the scenes stuff that people don't see, you know, the the look at it must have been easy for them. And <laughs> they're tooling away, never sleeping. How did they do that? Well, okay, let's talk about how they did that. And as it turns out, yeah. there's way more to it than you ever would have guessed. And, uh, you know, personally, I love to take on projects that I don't think anybody else would have the patience to do, you know, because it's got so many ridiculous steps in order to get there. Uh, And I think each of us finds our bliss in something that we are uniquely the person for that, you know, that that whatever the, the strange hoops that you have to jump through in order to arrive at that final image are things that that fit you and that you're going to enjoy doing but that other people wouldn't do and that's that's how it makes it yours yeah that's I mean I definitely I think that's what has helped in your career is fun you know or at least personally in my career was finding I do a lot of like narrative story you know I always call myself an illustrator because my I feel like my style is geared towards my client right so I'm more of an illustrator than a fine artist in in that regard like I'm drawing for them rather than here's my art put this on you And so, but it's, I do a lot of storytelling, narrative work. And I think that's why I'm also so attracted to the artists that I, you know, these particular artists, whether they're landscape artists is they're all telling narrative, these like narratives. And it's like, how do I create just, if I just only had a mountain trees to work with, how do I tell the story of this person's journey with just that? Like, those are the elements I've been given. And so, um, I think that's also outside of just the picture making part of of art that I like is like their ability to tell stories within the art. And then how are they, like you said, how are they using all those different like value or, you know, or um, the hues or whatever to tell, to tell this narrative, you know, whether it's just, whether it's just a character, you know, in, you know, like just a face or it's a, you know, portrait, like, cause you can read a person's face and, and a, when people do it right, it's very specific, the, the mood they're setting and the, the t- you know, the tone in that image or whether it's a landscape or, you know, and it doesn't make a difference what genre it goes through in art. A lot of the best artists are very intentional with what they want you to take away from the story behind that piece of art, so. Yeah, in fact, and to hear somebody interpret it in a different way from what you intended is kind of like, oh man, I must've blown it somewhere. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, there's some neat stuff out there. I don't know. So uh, there's a guy who I like. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, you keep going. Oh, uh, I was just going to say there's this one guy I came across recently, this Carl Spitzwig, who's like new to me. I've always liked, you know, I, I think I, that's why I was attracted to illustrators like JC Leyendecker or whatever. But I came across this guy, Carl Spitzwig, I think is his name. And, uh, it's just these fun, playful, like huh. narratives, you know. But the, I, what I what I started to try and take from this is like if you just his play of light, like it's got the dark background and the characters lit. It's that positive negative relationship, and huh. um, and then that one spot of color. So I know I'm supposed to look at those butterflies, and I that's the stuff I think sometimes when I when I am studying art, when I'm trying to like, how did they tell this story? You know, how are they putting it all together, all the pieces? Um, so those, yeah, was, beautiful yeah, Lion Decker, that's another guy I like a lot, an old, old illustrator, but yeah, completely different styles, but 
you know, yeah. they're, they're telling stories with their art. And, I think it's so important to to look at art in, in a variety of styles. And I think that many of us get caught up in this idea of, okay, well, I'm a bio artist, so I'm just gonna look at bio, or I'm a traditional yeah. artist, so I'm gonna follow nothing but traditional artists. And yeah, you'll learn something there, but yeah, yeah, end up in an echo chamber. Yeah. And uh, you really have a much richer life if you follow all of it. And, you know, I, I, I follow every kind of tattoo artist. I follow yeah. every kind of painter. I love landscape artists. I follow some that are, you know, the most meticulous technique you could imagine. I follow some very painterly, uh, some palette knife artists, uh, you know, all this stuff. Uh, I follow some portrait artists, some still life people. Uh, this, none of this has anything to do with biomech, right? Yeah. Uh, but it does have to do with making a picture. It has to do with lighting and color. It has to do with uh, what is attractive, learning what's attractive and what's attractive to you, right? You want to, you want to figure out what works for you and not second guess it and say, well, I yeah. want to know what works for everybody else. Yeah. Right. And then just try to be your very favorite artist, right? Use all the yeah, things yeah, yeah. you wish that you would see in art. Just bring it all together into your art and you should be your own favorite artist. And of course, none of us really <laughs> yeah. succeed at that, but that's, that's the direction that we should push ourselves. We shouldn't just be pushing ourselves towards being the internet's favorite artist because you, you just fail at that because yeah. you don't really know what you're aiming for. But when it comes to your own tastes, you don't have to guess about that. Yeah. That's been, for me, I know as an artist, it's been one of my, one of my own personal struggles is that I am so, I'm so attracted to so many variations in style. Um, and, and then I also wear the pigeonholing of the new school, like, well, you're the cartoon guy. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm more than just that, that just happened to be the thing that clicked, you know, but there's this idea of, of exploration that I find that sometimes when you get locked in, like as a, you know, being a bio guy yourself, like if that's, that's your thing, it's gonna be really hard for people to accept if you're like, I'm, I'm just gonna do portraits today. Like, that's it. Like today I'm gonna just, I'm gonna be a portrait artist from now on. And there's that, sometimes it's hard to like, we get trapped in this, like what we are, who we're identified as, as an artist. And I, I know personally, I struggle with that because there's times where I'm like, I don't know if I want to draw cartoons the rest of my life, period. You know, like, what if I want to try this? And so what I found is in order to like, be able to still sell it to people, like my, my desire to explore is I have to, I have to like segue into a new piece. So I'm gonna like, you know, like right now I'm doing a bunch of bird paintings. I just thought like, I'm gonna do a bunch of these like little bird paintings, you know? And then, but I'm trying to like loosen up my brushwork and I want, cause I want them to be looser rather than, you know, everything's tight and detailed, which is like the tattoo artist in me wants to hyper-focus on everything and tighten everything up. And so, so I'm, you know, I'll paint these birds and then I'll do like a really loose one and I'll segue it into the, to the mix. So it's still mine. And that way I can slowly introduce new ideas to people of like, this is something I really want to add to my world, but I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring it in in small amounts because I've, I've noticed I've lost audiences where they were like, I just want to see, I want to see the one song you, you know, hear that one song you recorded back in the eighties. And that's the only song you ever get to sing again. And then you're like, man, I have all this other like music inside me, you know, or art for me. It's like, I have all this art inside me and I'm, and I'm allowing myself to be dictated based on one hit single I had at one particular point of time. And, and then sometimes I'm like, what if there's something way better for me as an artist outside of that world? So I find I'm like always exploring new challenges. Like I went through a period where I was like, I'm going to try doing bio stuff. It's not really like, it's not the direction I fully want to go, but I wanted to grasp to understand it because maybe an element of it has a place in my future. And so I find as an artist, I'm constantly like trying new things. And then the hard part is somewhere along the way you lose your voice a little because you're like trying to sing a bunch of new songs. But the hope is that in the end, all those things come together. Like, yeah, it's going to look sloppy right now. It's going to look a little messy for a minute because I have to explore all these venues, you know, like even during this journey, like, you know, I'm hanging out with various tattoo artists right now that do different styles, like black and gray guys or traditional tattoo artists. And I pick their brains and I'm like, show me what you do, how you do what you do. I want to learn about that. 
And it's not because tomorrow I'm going to do only traditional tattoos or whatever, but because I'm like, maybe I'm missing an element that I should, there's like a little thing that's going to, that needs to be in my, in my toolbox. So that as an artist, I have, I have all the tools to create anything I want with. And now I'm going to put this collection together and it's going to look like a messy toolbox for a while till I start to organize them and figure out what needs to get thrown away and isn't serving me and which ones are serving me. And so that's kind of like, I think as an artist, that's been my toughest part of my artistic journey is there's always a desire to go above and beyond what people expect from you. Um, because there is like, you know, I got known for being a new school guy who does these cartoon things. It's been a hard, it's been hard to break away from um, because there's an audience that still wants to see that from me. And that's, that's what they want to collect. And because I sometimes am so afraid to, to, to abandon them, to abandon the people that have stuck with me this long to be like, yeah, I'm going to do this thing. So, so what I've tried to figure out is how do I take them on this ride with me? Like, how do I explore these realms, but not lose them along the way? And sometimes you lose people, you know, they're like, I'm not enjoying this part of the journey anymore and they'll fall away. And then you'll pick up new people, but that's the evolution. Of, I think that's the evolution, right? You, you know, like you look at someone like Pablo Picasso, who was, who was original, you know, classically trained painter, and people don't know that that, you know, that he has that lineage of like being able to do a fine, fine piece of art. Granted, he was able to do it at 14, but you know, he was able to create these fine art. And then he was like, now I'm going to make kid drawings. Like his goal was to get as close to like a cave painting as possible, right? So. He had to like lose parts of them along the way. And I got to imagine at points he was losing, losing some audience to gain a new audience. But the main audience is how, how do you find your true voice? Like finding its true self at the end, right? Does that, that make sense at all? Or? Yeah, well, I mean, so, so that, you know, ultimately what you're, when you're putting your valuable hours into these pieces of art that you know you're going to please yourself. You know, you're going to feel good about it and not just in your pocketbook. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, and I like to believe uh, is one of my articles of faith that do that long enough that your art should get good enough that you'll be able to keep food on your table or better. Yeah. Uh, I like to believe that, you know, and, and I know there's exceptions, you know, I know there's there's people who've really put in the effort and they have the vision and uh, the market just somehow doesn't connect with it. And uh Man, you know, I, and I almost never would give the, the advice of, oh, yeah, you've just got to play the social media game more because that's like, you know, the soul sucking, uh, degrading, you know, groveling kind of work to, do, to be doing if you're just trying to gain followers, hoping that some of them are actually going to become patrons. But, uh, you know, what alternatives are there anymore? Yeah. Well, and the other thing that I think sometimes gets lost is, I'm, um, I've now, as I've, you know, coming into this part of my art career, you know, having done this like the 25 years or whatever, and I have to imagine you experienced this too, where you're now becoming the oldest person in the room at most tattoo studios. So you're like, I know now I'm becoming the older, you know, like everywhere I go, they're 22, 25 year old crew for, for the majority of it. So I'm like, my career is older than most of the new tattoo artists that I'm meeting along the way. And so I, you know, constantly getting this like, oh, you know, like you're getting old, you know, like that's the new thing. We're getting old, we're getting old. And I'm like, yeah, but if I, t you know, like realistically, as long as I stay in good health, I have, I literally haven't even reached the halfway point of my full career. Right. Of my art, right. Of my art yeah. career. And now I have all this knowledge that I was able to gain over this last 25 years. And, you know, I was talking with Jesse Smith about this recently, because this was kind of where we came to is now I got 25 years to actually springboard the next part of my career off of. So I'm not starting from apprentice anymore. I'm starting from 25 years of knowledge. And now I've got another 25 years or whatever ahead of me to create this, a new career. And maybe, you know, as a career artist, it's hard because you, we do want to make you know, you do want the funds in there and, and that's an important part. But I personally have like decided to live more of a minimalist lifestyle so that I can afford to be an artist more importantly for myself, like so to explore art. 
And so in order to do that, I had to learn to give up some of the other luxuries so that I didn't have to rely on constantly making money off of the art as much as I needed to rely on uh, just being able to survive. You know, like, can I pay the bills? Can I eat? Okay, I'm good. Now I'm going to paint this painting. And I'm very conscious about that. So, you know, you create other income, you know, you have to have other passive incomes coming in so that you can kind of create that lifestyle. But what if the next part of my career doesn't hit till I'm 60? So I'm at 46 now. And what if the next big kick in doesn't happen for 20 years? You know, like there's so many people that are so afraid of some of this journey, like that they're willing to either give it up, you know, like one of the names that got brought up, I think I've, I've talked about this guy before and I'm gonna bring up a picture of him because it's a really like important part of what I'm seeing the level of depression and tattooing you're seeing a lot of depressed artists and you're going to know, I know people will know this painting. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I've so tattooed this, this one. you've tattooed this one, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this guy's name, uh, let me just find this real quick is guy. I'm going to screw it up. Cause I have so many names on my head right now. Um, this is uh, John William God Godward. And so that's one of his, this is another one of his. I mean, there's no denying the beauty and craftsmanship of these paintings. But as an artist, he fell out of favor. They just were not interested in his art anymore. Um, the times were changing and that style fell out of favor and he couldn't give, give these paintings away. Now we look at them and we're like, oh my God, look at these beautiful masterpieces. But at his time when he was relevant, they fell out of favor and he killed himself because he couldn't handle the pressure of not being successful. Like, I mean, that was, I'm sure there were other depressive issues that go into that and I don't want to downplay, you know, play that. But we live in a time where I watch other, you know, like you know, I've talked about mental health and tattooing quite a bit, but in artistry in general, and especially right now with all this stuff, we watch a lot of artists who put so much pressure on themselves to, to be at some level of performance that's an imaginary level of performance. It's like some crazy perceived level of performance and they don't allow themselves these moments of weakness or these moments of downtrodden or flops where maybe I get to have a moment where I just suck and nobody likes what I do. And that could go on for a little bit. I better build some coping mechanisms to deal with that because art is like this, you know, like some days people are going to love what you do and some days they're going to hate what you do. And so I, you know, like, for me, I, I, there's times where I struggle with that. Like, man, like I'm not getting the notoriety I once got or whatever, you know, like I hope my career didn't peak. And then the, the, the more like the part of me that realizes that I have to survive as an artist goes, hey man, you got to keep showing up and maybe you got to keep pushing forward towards a new period of time. Maybe that time never comes. Like, what do you do then? But that's a thing artists I think really need to like doesn't get talked about enough by artists is the fact that we're gonna have, like art is like this. Like I just showed, you know, a bunch of different styles and all of them came and went out of favor at some point in time. Like you don't see Norman Rockwell on the, you know, the cover of Saturday Evening Post now because that magazine is out of favor, you know, like now it's a new generation of artists or whatever. And so one, you've got to become adaptive as an artist. You've got to be open to the idea that you're changing with time to some degree. Like we can't constantly hold on to this past during this, you know, because it's constantly fluid. Like art is constantly fluid. And you have to have one foot in the door of relevance of like what's actually happening in this movement right now. But I wouldn't swim in that pool all to get like full with both, you know, like all to get all in. Like I'm only going to do what's relevant right now because that's going to change. It's going to, it's going to change again. And so some people are basing their whole art careers on this one moment in time, thinking it's never gonna disappear, like 90s new school didn't disappear, but everything, look, but it's gonna go through these things. And it's, you can't have a long-term career without adjusting with this. And you'll have these ups and downs and ups and downs and you know the peaks and valleys. And so when everything sucks, like I'm not getting noticed up here, then I'm practicing a lot down here, you know? And then, one day the stuff gets noticed again, like your art becomes seen and more visible because you've been putting in all these hours and then you get seen. And then you might not because there's new artists that are popular and you get back to work. Um, so 
you know, even as much as I love the museums and stuff, like the art, you know, coming back to all these, that's why I also am constantly taking an influence, but I'm being aware of the fact that some of this stuff fell in and out of favor. Like, and I, I think that's an important thing. Yeah, you know, probably why Travis didn't want to latch himself to the concept of the, of the um, pop surrealism. Right. Like if I'm attached to that movement and that movement becomes irrelevant, do I become irrelevant? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's that's a tough one, and uh, you know, especially if your thing has has been popular long enough that you don't really know how to do much else. You yeah. know, become you know very much your you know it, it's easy to become a one trick pony. Yeah. Uh, especially if you become very good at one particular thing because you've learned everything you can about that particular thing. You've invested everything into it, so it'd be very hard to call that a favor. You know, yeah. to, to watch that. Uh, you know, fade in popularity and, and, uh, uh, but, but it happens, you know, uh, well, it's, and it's, it's, so fast right now, you know, that, that it's, you can't be Elvis for very long. Yeah. You know? Well, and you, it's you tough. Can't. Go ahead. Uh, so there's a, two. Oh, okay. You can, some of the, uh, sorry, I got to know. Um, the other thing too, is that sometimes when you're in it, you know, one of the struggles I know I had like it with mine is, Am I doing stuff that is, am I maintaining a sense of contemporary in my art or am I still doing something that is, was cool 20 years ago? Like, am I, is, is my art become kitsch? You know, like, am I doing that's right. something that's irrelevant? And sometimes it's hard, you're like stuck there with blinders. So when you do live in this bubble, you know, this echo chamber and you're not getting feedback from other people, that, that can become super dangerous. I think one of the things I admire that you do that I really like that you've done in your career is you will work alongside young artists that are coming up in, in the field that you're a part of, you know, in, in your world. So you're constantly being introduced to fresh ideas while at the same time giving back, you know, giving to that generation of up and comers. And I think that's awesome. Um, it's something I've kind of like been thinking about, like how do I like start working with people again that are, you know, have a fresh, fresh take on things because I, I don't have the same taste as what's going on. So I'm not connected to a, some of that stuff either at all. Like, so well, it's nice to even, hear, hear their voices sometimes. Even if some of it is like, not exactly what you would do, you can still tell if you like it, you know, if yeah. it's like, wow, that's really amazingly well, well done. I'm very impressed by this. Uh, and so if you do get a chance to collaborate with them, then you might absorb a little something from it. It's very hard because ultimately everything you do is going to come out of your own hand and look like your art. And that's one thing I have discovered is I have to push very hard. I have to really work hard at, at not being habitual. If I want any of these things that I learned from our other artists to stick, but uh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you, you look, you look at your phone, you're going to see so much art that's good that you're going to feel intimidated sometimes. And my response to that is to contact these artists and say, Hey man, let's, let's do a piece together. Yeah. 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 I, I think that's a good, a good approach. I, like I said, right now, I like the idea of just, I've been looking over the shoulders of artists and kind of just trying to like become inspired again by what others are doing and get out of my studio for a second and see the world a little, but yeah, I, I, fresh eyes, seeing the world through some fresh eyes, but. Yeah, it's, it's very, very hard to not develop this self-blindness, you know, because we, we uh, have an idea of what we wish we were as artists. And we have an idea of what we want our work to look like and how we want it to affect people when they see it. But, uh, you know, we're, we're not, it, it's, it's hard to be very honest about this stuff with ourselves, you know, because yeah. uh, so loaded with our expectations and our wishes and, and our hopes and dreams and fears and insecurities. Oh, do we have time for a few audience questions, Gabe? Have we had anyone uh, post anything or? Well, let me, uh, yeah, the, definitely lots of action in a couple of the different chat rooms. I think there's even some uh, artists who are meeting up for collaborations and maybe even guest spot action. Let me, uh, let me just start running through them in the reinventing community. So this is in the mobile app. If anybody uh, wants, they could download the reinventing the tattoo app in either of the app stores. Okay, Nate Rogers is, uh, oh, I'm reaching 3D printers in the YouTube. So some people are watching over on the YouTube as well as in the app. 
Uh, uh, Joshua Vaughn says, glad to be able to tune in. Thank you guys for putting this out. Uh, Judas Priest says, this is really cool. Lazar says, hi from Bosnia. Uh, Nate Rogers, obviously you guys talked a lot about uh, artists you like to reference. He's into John Martin Apocalypse Painter lately. Uh, let's see some other uh, artists that have come up. Uh, Lucian Freud. Uh, Lucian Freud, yeah. Sigmund Freud's uh, grandson. Uh, incredible painter. I'm not familiar with it. I'll have to look that up. You know, one thing about Freud is when you look at his paintings, it's, it's very big brush, thick paintings, and it looks like they were effortless. Uh, oh, really? Which, yeah, but then I read a, an interview with somebody who was actually painted by him, and it took eight months. Uh, every brush stroke is carefully loaded, put on the canvas. The brush is cleaned off completely. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's very, very thickly painted stuff. Uh, that's a self-portrait. And it's not beautiful. The technique is beautiful. The paintings themselves tend to be sort of like, sort of melancholy, you know, yeah, but uh, yeah. I'm very impressed by it. Uh, Cool. Okay, so let's see. Also, uh, Carvaggio, Rembrandt came up. Uh, lowbrow stuff like Robert Williams, Crayola, Ryden. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Like I said, there was a whole round of people meeting each other, which is awesome. As uh, you guys nice. were talking about collabs and whatnot. On the YouTube's, we have uh, Tattoos by Course says hello from Canada, land of the frostbite. Uh, mm -hmm. Stadi198 says, hi guys, Hungary is here, uh, Hungary the country. We got oh, nice. Atomic Injections from Marietta, Georgia. Uh, Bunny Corpse, hi guys, joining here from South Africa. Oh boy, okay. then uh, a tons more actually. It's uh, uh, a lot of compliments. Let's see. I love that the the globe is tuning in, you know, really. Uh, yeah, it's, that's, it's really, really that's really neat. You know, the, it, as much as we've lost with social media, we've gained that. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of uh, people dropping all sorts of, of names all over the, the chat rooms. So the people that are watching. Other artists? Are, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So yeah, anyone who's, who's watching this and enjoyed seeing this art and hearing some of these names, uh, yeah, check out some of the names people are dropping in the chat. Uh, we are going to continue doing this every two weeks. Uh, next uh talk we're having two weeks from now is going to be with brandon bean from dark skin body art uh we're going to get into uh and since it's black history month uh, we're going to uh focus on black artists including going all the way back to traditional uh african roots uh we have uh, women in our history after that uh do we have Julie Bell confirmed for that yet, Gabe, or where are we up to? Uh, not for the dates. I have to dive back into Facebook land as like okay. myself to do so. So I try to limit my exposure. <laughs> and then but I, uh, but I'll get on it. She, she's definitely, it sounds like she's down. We just need to set the date. And then Kiyoki is going to be joining us to, to talk about South Pacific Island art. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, and the history of that. So, uh, yeah, he came oh, up here one time just for us to, yeah, we were going to, uh, possibly do a collaboration and you know he, he got lost in about three hours of, of our history discussions like man we got to get this guy on the, on camera so uh, yeah we'll be doing this every two weeks going into art history and uh, um, we'd love to hear anyone who, who's got ideas uh, about uh, eras of art history that you'd like to hear about please let us know um, right now we're just kind of randomly skipping around trying to you know experience the entire vastness of it because there's so much to learn right but yeah. uh um gunner thank you so much for for joining us today and, and uh, sharing thanks for having your, me your experience and your knowledge and i'm hoping that i can talk you into uh maybe joining us for a live drawing group at some point uh, okay sounds but, good uh, we'll uh, we'll talk about that uh, in dms at, uh, at some point and yeah, uh yeah. uh russ thanks for facilitating uh gunner uh if you're still there yeah uh, he's saying uh right on uh, good talking to you, Russ, and uh, everyone else. Thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, we'll be seeing you at our, our next events. You can uh, uh, at the top uh, of the menu and uh, your homepage of your Reinventing the Tattoo app is the events listing, and you can see everything that we've got coming up, uh, well, which uh, goes on and on and on. It's a lot of great free live programming. So uh, download the app if you uh, want to have easier access to it.